All righty. Well, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for um, joining us tonight for an incredible conversation and learning experience around the um, bird life of Cumberland Island, in particular, and in particular, shorebirds. Um, this educational experience, Cumberland Island, a refuge for birds, is brought to you um, through a partnership between Georgia Audubon, Wild Cumberland, and for this session, Manomet as well. Um, and Georgia Audubon and Wild Cumberland have uh, partnered to provide a series of educational events that focus on connecting people um, with the incredible biodiversity of Cumberland Island, because while many of us in the state of Georgia might be aware of Cumberland, most of us cannot necessarily easily access it. So we wanna bring you to Cumberland Island by talking about the biodiversity, the science that's happening on the seashore, as well as the ways in which we are connected to that beautiful and our largest barrier island. So we're excited to bring to you the second installation of our um, educational partnership. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Jessica with Wild Cumberland to tell you a little bit about the island, about Wild Cumberland, um, and give you a little bit of context about what this island has to offer before we pass it over to Abby. Jessica. Thanks, Karina. Thank you all so much for being here and from so many different places. Um, I really want to thank Georgia Audubon and Manomet for partnering with us to make sure that everybody in our state and beyond has an opportunity to understand and experience why Cumberland Island is so important, um, especially to birds. So without further ado, I am going to share my screen and hopefully in just a second, you will be able to see my presentation. I'm getting old, so bear with me. Of course, older as we wait. All right, here we go. So for those of you who are not familiar with Cumberland Island National Seashore, <clears throat> it is Georgia's largest and most southernmost barrier island. Uh, there are approximately 17 miles of undeveloped shoreline there, which is part of what makes it so special and such an important part of our ecosystem. There are no paved roads on the island and you cannot access it by bridge, by car, but it is accessible to the public by the park service, uh, the National Park Services, who is responsible for managing Cumberland Island National Seashore and you can access it by ferry. We will have a little bit more information about that for you at the end of the presentation if you're interested. Um, just to, before we turn it over to Abby and she talks to us a little bit more about the birds of Cumberland Island, um, I think it's important for us to all understand that more than 20,000 acres were designated as wilderness and potential wilderness in 1982. Um, that includes recovering maritime forests, wetlands, tidal creeks, marshes and sand dunes. This map here doesn't really do justice to the variety of ecosystems um, that you find on Cumberland Island, but that large green swath is um, officially designated wilderness and the yellow that you see there is potential wilderness. Um, Cumberland Island Wilderness is also home to one of the largest freshwater lakes on any of our barrier islands, which is especially important for our migratory birds. Um, and there are actually more than 300 different species of birds that have been recorded on Cumberland. So um, there, as Abby will begin to tell you, there are many species of migratory birds and shorebirds that Cumberland Island is important for. Um, but we often receive some questions about wilderness and what it means and why we use a capital W actually. Um, so I just wanna take a second and explain that the Wilderness Act was created almost 60 years ago um, when our leaders understood that our population was booming and that mechanization and, and development was already um, increasing at a rate that we needed to protect and preserve some of these wild places and lands. Um, so it requires an act of Congress to designate a wilderness and less than 5% of our entire nation is protected by this um, level of designation. It's important for a lot of reasons. Um, Abby's going to go into the many reasons that birds can appreciate our wilderness, but it's important to us too. Um, it's one of the best places that scientists like 
Dr. Sterling. Um, students and the public can learn about natural resources. It gives you and I a reprieve from all of this technology that we depend on so heavily. Um, and it protects ecosystems that are actually critical for our own survival. So um, wilderness can help us navigate climate change because it provides undisturbed areas for um, species, uh, including birds, but it gives them a break in a lot of ways. It's a refuge from the development um, and the human population as it stands right now. So it's those species that have access to those areas have the best opportunities to thrive. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Abby, and she is going to get to tell you a little bit more about why and how um, Cumberland Island matters to birds in particular. Thanks, Abby. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, now, as uh, Jess said, we are going to turn it over to Dr. Abby Sterling, um, who is a shorebird biologist and director of the Georgia Bite Shorebird Conservation Initiative with Manomet. Um, Dr. Sterling earned her doctorate degree from the University of Georgia, where she studied the influence of habitat and landscape features on beach nesting shorebirds and chick survival. Um, prior to her degree, she worked as a naturalist and a guide on Little St. Simons Island, where she assisted on a variety of environmental projects, educated visitors, and she is a phenomenal educator, as you will see, um, about coastal ecology and explore the southeastern coast. Um, now, she is originally from Western New York and attended the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry for her Bachelor of Science in Environmental Biology. Um, she is, of course, no stranger to Georgia Audubon and certainly not to Cumberland Island, so we're excited to have her back to share with you um, her expertise and her perspective on the work um, and the biodiversity that exists on Cumberland Island. So, Dr. Abby, I will turn it over to you now. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Karina. That's so sweet. Um, I'm very grateful to be here today with you. And thank you um, to Georgia Audubon and Wild Cumberland for this opportunity. Um, tonight, I'm very excited to join all of you. Um, we're up to 75 folks here, which is really exciting uh, to talk a little bit about how important Cumberland Island is uh, for some of Georgia's shorebirds. Um, and I'm going to pull this together, share my screen with you all so that you can see. Um, <clears throat> great. Um, so tonight um, we are going to be talking about how important Cumberland is uh, for shorebirds. And it is a really special place um, in the, along the Georgia coast. Uh, generally our coast is, is critical for a whole range of different shorebirds and, uh, and Cumberland Island is a big part of that. Um, so, I'm going to make it. <laughs> there we go. Um, so, I wanted to kind of frame tonight's talk um, through thinking about connections, really. Um, Cumberland Island is important because the shorebirds that we get to see here on the Georgia coast and on Cumberland do connect us to the entire hemisphere. Um, so tonight I'm going to be sharing stories with you all um, actually throughout the entire year because Cumberland's important year round for shorebirds. And so we'll talk a little bit about uh, summer when we have nesting shorebirds, um, which is when I became most acquainted with Cumberland doing my PhD research that Karina mentioned. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about migration as well because that's a very exciting time when we have these world travelers that are visiting our coast, including Cumberland. Um, and we will also talk about winter. Cumberland is very special for um, several different species. One is the piping plover. And so I'll share some stories with you all about some of the piping plovers that have used Cumberland Island um, recently. We'll talk a little bit about some of the threats uh, to Cumberland's shorebirds and then wrap up with um, sort of a big picture conversation about some of the tools that we have in our toolbox to address those threats. But I wanted to take a step back um, because I know with the magic of technology and Zoom, we could have people joining from anywhere with a whole array of backgrounds. And so um, <laughs> I wanted to start with the very most basic, what is a shorebird? Um, shorebirds are a very diverse group of birds that includes sandpipers and plovers. Um, and, and they're feeding in wet areas, sort of where water meets land. So we think a lot about shorebirds being on beaches. They don't all um, occur on beaches. Sometimes you'll see them in the interior part of the country and wetlands um, and freshwater areas as well. 
But uh, these birds have long legs and long bills that they use to probe down into those moist muds and sands to find insects and invertebrates. So different than wading birds like herons or egrets and also different than ducks. They don't have webbed feet, they don't swim. Um, and so that, that kind of broad designation of shorebirds, you can sort of think of um, sandpipers and plovers, but they come in a variety of shapes and sizes, which we'll talk a little bit about tonight. Um, and, and, and then moving from that most basic, what is a shorebird? I wanted to sort of set the stage for us tonight. Um, Cumberland Island is a really incredible place. Um, and, and one of the things that makes it so incredible is actually geographic processes that are happening at a much larger scale. So we are located in what's called the Georgia Bight. And the Georgia Bight um, ranges from Cape Canaveral down in Florida, all the way up to Cape Hatteras um, up here in North Carolina. It's kind of the curved part of the coastline that you, you see when you see a map sort of zoomed out. And because of that curve, um, you can see Cumberland marked right here with that little blue star um, located kind of on the southern part of, of the bite. But because of that curve, we have a lot of different things that are happening that basically create the perfect set of conditions for shorebirds. So one of the things that we see here, um, the Georgia coast uh, and, and South Carolina coast are highlighted in yellow. This is the main area that I focus my work on. Um, you can see the edge of the continent is quite far from the actual continental shelf. Um, and so because of that, there's a very shallow slope all the way to the edge of the continental shelf. And because of that, there's things going on that are really important. Um, one, you can see this dark line here, uh, highlighted by that blue arrow, shows you that the average wave height gets lower as you get towards the middle part of the, of the bite, right? It's curved and it kind of bottles all that water up. The other thing that happens is we have a really high spring tidal range. So six to eight feet towards the middle part of the bite. Because we've got low wave energy and a high tidal range, that's one of the things that gives us this really lovely chain of bare islands that stretches along the whole coast, protecting the mainland from the ocean. And it also really helps create the perfect conditions for creating this expansive uh, network of salt marsh, mud flats, and sandbars that, that feed a lot of shorebirds. The other thing that happens in the Georgia Bight is that we have a lot of inlets. You can see uh, this black bar here showing you that you get more inlets as you get towards the middle of the bite. And those inlets are spaced really close together as you get towards the middle part of the bite. So inlets are areas where the water is coming out into the ocean and those areas uh, are really nutrient rich, bringing sediment, nutrients, sands down to the coastal areas. And that builds up habitat, feeds the invertebrates and creates perfect conditions for shorebirds. So I really, like to say that the Georgia bite has kind of the perfect recipe for shorebird habitat, right? We have extensive remote beaches on our barrier islands. We have this high tidal range that creates vast expanses of mud and sand flats, um, in turn providing the resources to create a very abundant, rich food base for shorebirds. So all of the invertebrates are eating all of the nutrients that are in the water. And it means basically you could almost think of like unlimited food resources where the system is getting refreshed by these big tides twice a day. The Altamaha River and other large river estuaries bring down tons of sand and nutrients that create great habitat. And we also have, when you compare our coastline to areas to the north and south, a lot less shoreline engineering and fewer modified inlets. So all of those natural processes like erosion and accretion can continue uninterrupted. There's also a lot of places with limited disturbance. And in the interior part of the state, we have impoundments and managed wetlands that provide really great resources for shorebirds as well. So what we see because of that is the Georgia Barrier Islands have been designated as a landscape of hemispheric importance through the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network. And we are critical habitat throughout the entire year. That makes us unique when you think about other places like the Northeast where when it win comes winter, uh, it's not so good for shorebirds, but here we support shorebirds throughout the entire year. So that's during migration from about August to October um, for fall migration, which is where we are right in the middle of now, and then spring migration from March to May. Also winter is a really important time and we'll talk about that. Great food resources that in our mild climate means we can support shorebirds in, in pretty significant numbers throughout the winter. And then during the nesting season as well, the Georgia coast and Cumberland Island are really important. 
Um, and so now we'll zoom in a little bit and take you uh, to Cumberland. And Cumberland is really incredible because it's got this huge diversity of habitats like Jess mentioned. But even if you think about the beach, about 17 miles of beach, the beach itself is really diverse. If you were to walk that whole stretch of beach, you would see um, it changes dramatically depending on where you are. There's well-developed dune systems, there's huge overwash flats, and there's large expansive beaches as well. And all of these diverse habitats mean that there are a diversity of different opportunities for shorebirds uh, throughout the day and throughout the year. And so um, it provides important areas for roosting during high tide, um, feeding during low tide, nesting in the dunes, and rich food resources, including horseshoe crab spawning, uh, which fuels migrating shorebirds. So we'll talk about that too. And so my plan for this evening is to take you kind of on a journey throughout the year and share some of the stories of the shorebirds that rely on Cumberland Island at different stages of the annual cycle. Um, so we're going to start with summer because um, nobody can resist a shorebird chick. And we're going to talk about two of the species that nest on Cumberland Island. And those are American oyster catchers and Wilson's plovers. These are high priority species um, that are managed and, and monitored um, by State Department of Natural Resources and a variety of other folks. Um, and they were the focus of my PhD research at University of Georgia. So I first got to know Cumberland really through understanding how these birds use Cumberland Island. Both American oyster catchers, this nice, beautiful, very easy to recognize large shorebird and the small and sneaky Wilson's plover nest right out on the open beach. They're beach nesting shorebirds. So they make a shallow depression on the sand and they lay their eggs right out on the open sand. And the main mode of defense here is that these chicks, you can see two Wilson's plover chicks and an egg with a female Wilson's plover behind them here in, the, in this photo. The main line of defense is that they blend in really well. Um, and so we'll talk more about that as we, as we get into really understanding the story of these beach nesting shorebirds. Um, it is not easy to nest out on the beach in Georgia or on Cumberland, um, but these birds are extremely dedicated. And so both um, for American oyster catchers and Wilson's plovers, uh, both the male and the female incubate the eggs throughout the summer. And during the summer, incubation means keeping the eggs shaded and cool so that they don't overheat in the blazing sun. They're also um, very dedicated uh, parents that perform incredible behavioral displays. So this is Wilson's plovers performing a broken wing display. And they're basically feigning injury so that the annoying shorebird biologist cannot find their nest, which is tucked here in this beach elder. They pretend to be injured and lure the threat away from the nest. And then once the threat is far enough away from the nest, they go right back to it. And so uh, for both American oyster catchers and Wilson's plovers, really dedicated parents, and it takes nearly a month of that dedication before the eggs will hatch. And so ants here. Um, Wilson's plovers take about 25 days before their eggs hatch, and then they hatch into cute little fuzzy precocial chicks. And so precocial chicks are like a baby chick or a baby duckling. They're a little bit more independent than something like a baby wren or a baby robin where they hatch and they're not even fully feathered. These guys in a matter of about 15 minutes will be fully feathered and mobile, and they will leave this little nest bowl and move around the beach with their parents as a little family unit. So for my research and trying to understand what different habitat characteristics uh, look like around successful nests versus unsuccessful nests, part of that research was banding these little chicks. So I would go to the nests, um, catch the chicks, put color bands on their legs, and those bands will fit. They, they won't constrict their legs at all as they grow. Um, they'll, their legs sort of just get longer. They don't get any wider. So. Um, they'll wear those bands throughout their life and every bird gets its own unique color combination so that it can be linked back to the nest and help answer important questions about what habitat features influence nest success. Um, so I would ban these chicks and then let them go and they would um, rejoin their families and then run around on the beach and, uh, and spend time um, foraging with their parents, eating insects and fiddler crabs and things like that. Wilson's plover chicks um, uh, and oyster catcher chicks are basically born to run. 
Um, but when they're frightened, they'll duck down and they'll hide in vegetation. So this is one of the reasons that during the summer, it is really important uh, to stay actually below the tide line when you're out on a beach. Nesting shorebirds, their main line of defense, as I said, they blend in really well. And these little chicks are about mm, this, this big. They're like little fuzzy peanuts on toothpicks. Um, and so they can be really, really difficult to spot. So when there's nesting birds in an area, the very best thing you can do, stay below the tide line, stay on the wet sand, and that way you can avoid um, potentially accidentally trampling chicks or nests. And it takes them about 40 days before they're actually able to fly. So this is a fledged chick. It, it is capable of flying. Um, it's about the same size as the adult. There's a few differences in the plumage, um, but, but it's really not until that point that they are safe from threats. Um, Cumberland is a, is a very important place for nesting shorebirds. I did all of my research on Long Point, which is the very northernmost, maybe mile and a half stretch of the Beach of Cumberland. And you can see each colored dot here represents a nest. Um, some of those are failed nests where the birds re-nested. So we estimated there were about between nor the north end of Cumberland here and Little Cumberland just to the north of Cumberland, we estimated there were about 50 pairs of Wilson's plovers that were using Cumberland and about six pairs of American oyster catchers. Um, during the time that I was doing this research, nesting success was, was highly variable each year because of different conditions with like weather and, and predation. Tidal overwash is a very big threat for nesting birds and predation is a really significant threat as well. Um, one of the issues that occurs on Cumberland Island is that there's non-native coyotes and they can be um, really detrimental um, to nesting shorebirds. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, but this is just to illustrate the importance of this area here for nesting shorebirds. The south end of Cumberland as well is really kind of the other hot spot for beach nesting birds. So that's what's happening in the summer on Cumberland Island. Bookending summer is migration. And so we have spring migration, which we're going to talk about tonight and fall migration as well, which is ongoing, as I said. And shorebirds are one of the, the most noteworthy groups of animals for migration. Um, migration is basically population level movement um, at a large scale. And so when we think about migrating shorebirds, we usually talk about it in terms of flyways. Uh, these birds will have specific areas that they tend to stick to. So we're part of this pink swath here, the Atlantic flyway, but there's also shorebirds that really focus on the middle part of the country using the mid-continent flyway, and then the west coast is the Pacific flyway. And so um, you can see this uh, image with all these rainbow tracks here. All of these are individual birds that have been making these huge movements. Generally, migration occurs from the southern hemisphere with birds that spend our winter down in, the, in South America and Central America, moving north up into uh, the Northern Hemisphere and up into the Arctic for breeding. Huge groups of birds moving um, all together, joining up in large flocks um, and making these tremendous journeys. During migration, we see some pretty cool things, um, some exciting rarities. And so um, these all came from a wonderful contributor, Pat Leary, who I'm not sure if Pat is on this uh, webinar tonight, but he and his wife Doris are really invaluable. They've done a tremendous amount of uh, surveys, reciting birds, um, spending days and hours on Cumberland Island monitoring what's going on with shorebirds on Cumberland. So if anybody's going to find a cool rarity on Cumberland, um, I think it's going to be Pat and Doris. Um, so they shared some of these photos and, and many others that you'll see throughout this presentation, and I'm very grateful uh, for all of their efforts. But um, just wanted to, for those birders in the audience tonight to give you a little snippet. Um, last year, there was a buff-breasted sandpiper that was visiting in the fall migration period. And um, many years before that, American golden plover. Um, and as well, during fall migration, uh, a curlew sandpiper, super rare vagrant. And so really during fall migration, uh, you never know who's gonna turn up. And, and these are some examples. Snowy plovers are also um, found pretty often on Cumberland Island, but that's the only place that you'll find them. And there's one, two, or now just recently, Pat uh, documented a third snowy plover on Cumberland. So uh, those guys are um, more common in Florida, um, but in the state of Georgia, Cumberland's the only place you can go to see a snowy plover. Um, I think migration for shorebirds is a really exciting thing. 
And so understanding what's going on with migrating shorebirds is really important, understanding how Cumberland fits into the larger picture of what's going on with shorebirds on our Georgia coast. And so when we see migrating shorebirds um, in the spring, this photo is from the spring, these birds are really focused on just a couple of things, eating and resting. And you can see they're molting into this nice breeding plumage. The red knots are getting red, the dunlin get this nice black belly. During the winter, we'll have some of these birds, but they're very gray. They don't really stand out, but in the spring, they start getting all decked out, um, getting ready to go up to the Arctic. And one of the reasons I think migrating shorebirds are so fascinating is because it highlights that shorebirds have a double life. Um, when we see them down here, like I said, they're just eating and resting. And those are really important things that they need to do to build up the fuel reserve to make these incredible journeys up into the Arctic. But they leave here in spring when it's the perfect temperature and we're just really getting in to enjoying beach weather. And they leave our lovely balmy 80 degree beaches and they go up to the Arctic uh, to nest on the tundra. And this is where their life switches completely. Um, so they go up, it may be completely covered in snow um, and they have to find a territory, they have to find a mate, they have to nest, lay eggs and raise chicks. And they have a very narrow, maybe two month window uh, for, for nesting. And so our nesting shorebirds down here in Georgia, nesting season is from about April all the way until almost sometimes July. Uh, these guys have a much narrower window to actually successfully raise chicks. And when they're in the Arctic, they have incredible breeding displays, they have songs, um, they live really an entirely different life that you would never, uh, never expect. Um, I think one of my favorite to think about that is the ruddy turnstone. That's a really common bird that you'll see wandering up and down the beaches and almost on any island that you go to, I think, in Georgia. Um, and to me, they always sort of stand out because they're this nice calico color. They've got a really pretty pattern on their front that's kind of like a, a little collar, bright orange legs. And every time I have ever seen a ruddy turnstone, um, before I got to spend any time in the Arctic, I always looked at them and I said, what, what are you dressed for? You don't blend in here. You don't match the environment at all. You stand out. You are so, so flashy. Um, and the reason that they're so flashy is because they are all decked out for the Arctic. And so when we get to see these spring migrating shorebirds on Cumberland Island, um, and they're in that rusty colored breeding plumage or they've got this really interesting patterning. A lot of that is so that they blend in perfectly when they arrive in their Arctic tundra nesting grounds. And so one of the, the most noteworthy, well-known migrating shorebird is of course the red knot. Um, in the spring, just before they leave us at the end of May, they're this beautiful rust color. Um, and some of these red knots travel um, a tremendous distance, a 19,000 mile journey year round every single year. Some of these birds go from the very southern part of South America in Tierra del Fuego, um, and they'll take a, a jump of about 4,000 miles, land up in Brazil, fuel up again, fly out over open water, fly another maybe 3,500 miles, land here in the southeast, and join us for a few weeks where they're fueling up again to make another final leap all the way up to the Arctic. And so one of the things that we know is that these birds have what's called site fidelity. Site fidelity means that every single migration, they're gonna stop at very nearly the same places because they know that those places are safe and that they have good food resources. Those are the two critical pieces to a successful migration. And so on Cumberland Island, there have, there's several different food resources, but one of the main food resources um, that fuels northbound migration during the spring is horseshoe crab eggs. And so uh, horseshoe crabs will spawn in the spring. They lay all their eggs, these little green babies on the tide line. We'll talk about it again towards the end here. And that is a really easy to digest um, food resource that, that packs on the fat that becomes the fuel that carries these birds all the way on up to the Arctic. And so um, one of the most famous red knots that kind of uh, helps, helped everyone understand what they are doing was this bird that was banded and recited over and over again for nearly 20 years. Because of that site fidelity, they were coming back to the same spot uh, year after year. And, and so B95 was recited um, enough times that 
it was calculated that that bird traveled the distance to the moon and back on those migration journeys. Um, red knots are now considered federally threatened because of really significant population declines. And so making sure that Cumberland Island and other places along the Georgia coast can continue to support these populations of migratory shorebirds is really important. Um, there's been some really exciting research recently that's highlighted just how important the Southeast is for migrating red knots. You see each of these little colored blips is a different bird that's been outfitted with a transmitter so it can be tracked. And you saw that explosion of birds coming out of the Southeast here. Some of them went up here to Delaware Bay and then onto the Arctic, but about two thirds of these birds traveled from the Southeast directly up to their Arctic nesting grounds. And that means they're able to find enough food here along the Georgia Bight uh, to, to make that journey and nest up in the Arctic. So just highlighting the importance of the Georgia Bight and places like Cumberland Island for birds like red knots. And then the last stage of the calendar year is of course winter. And winter on Cumberland is really exciting. Um, winter is very, uh, wintering habitat is really important for shorebirds. They need quiet places where they're able to eat, um, find good food resources and rest. And so um, there's many different species that spend the winter here. We'll see large flocks of birds wintering with us um, on many of the barrier islands. But one of the, the kind of stars of the show during the winter are the piping clovers. And so um, I checked with Pat and got his approval to share several different stories of some of the piping clovers that he's seen on Cumberland because he's been doing these uh, repeated surveys on Cumberland looking at uh, wintering um, piping clovers. And so there's three different breeding areas for piping clovers. Um, shown here in this kind of peach color, there's a very small winter uh, breeding population that you cannot see here in the Great Lakes. And that is the federally uh, endangered species, uh, subpopulation of piping clovers that's nesting in the Great Lakes. And a lot of the birds that we have visiting us in the winter, shown in blue on the map, um, come actually from the Great Lakes region. Um, but we do see piping clovers on Cumberland from all three breeding groups, um, including this one here that Pat just saw um, and posted. And, uh, and this bird here, you can see it's got a unique combination of bands. Um, and, and so this bird actually came from Delaware, which is pretty neat. Uh, another very compelling story um, that I wanted to share with you tonight was, was this bird, this individual, um, Pat uh, and Doris recited fairly recently on Cumberland. And they coordinated with researchers uh, that are part of the Great Lakes Piping Clover Conservation Team to get the backstory on this bird. The, one of the really cool things when we talk about connections with shorebirds, when there's individuals that are banded, that's one of the things that brings people together. And so I always think about that when I see a banded bird. It's not just the person um, like Pat and Doris who have recited it on Cumberland. It's not just the managers of Cumberland making sure that it's uh, protected and safe for piping clovers, but it's also the folks up in the Great Lakes at Silver Lake uh, that, that are, you know, Silver Lake State Park in Michigan that are protecting the habitat protecting the nest. So this is the nest that this individual bird hatched from um, and volunteers um, and managers and stewards protect these areas because many of the spots that they're nesting, particularly along the Great Lakes are important uh, for people as well and highly visited. And so um, just kind of a, a really cool connection. This particular bird was the only fledgling out of four eggs at its nest at Silver Lake State Park. Um, so it, it was successfully raised, hatched, fledged, and left Silver Lake and came down here to Cumberland Island to spend the winter. A couple other very famous piping clovers um, that we got to see actually last year um, came from Chicago. Montrose Beach uh, had a pair of nesting uh, piping clovers that were named Monty and Rose. They generated headlines like you wouldn't believe. A movie was made about them. And their chicks, they had three chicks in 2019 that successfully fledged and Pat and Doris got to actually see one of those chicks. So um, they recited Hazel um, in 2019. And that was a really exciting moment for us. Another very cool story of a, of a wintering bird 
on Cumberland that Pat shared with me is the oldest semi-palmated plover spends its winters on Cumberland Island. Um, and so this bird, um, he just saw it on October 7th. Um, and you can see here, um, they breed all the way up in the Arctic here. Uh, so this bird was banded on Cumberland in 2003. Um, and uh, in part of the research conducted by Dr. Eric Knoll at Trent University. Um, and so this bird, one of the oldest semi-palmated plovers is at least 18 years old. It's pretty incredible. And here's just a just to give you a sense of the numbers of semi-palmated plovers that we see on Cumberland, a, a big flock of, of wintering uh, semi-palmated plovers. So um, unfortunately, um, it is not all um, just incredible stories here. Um, when we think about shorebirds as a group, um, we're seeing some really significant population declines for shorebirds, particularly for some of the more long distance migrating species of shorebirds. Um, this has been uh, widely um, publicized in even just uh, the, the media and, and press, um, but it's also uh, the focus of a lot of work at both federal, um, international and state level, um, trying to really understand what's going on with uh, shorebirds and why we're seeing these really stark population declines. Uh, Manomet's been a part of guiding a, a large citizen science volunteer effort called the International Shorebird Survey, uh, where volunteers have been conducting surveys since about the 1970s. And you see these trends really start in about 1970. So we have a long-term data set that's showing that generally when we look at shorebird species, um, we're seeing uh, about a 40% decline since the 70s of, of shorebirds. And it's even more dramatic for these long distance migrating shorebirds. Shorebirds face a lot of different conservation challenges. Um, and, and in part, that's because of their biology, right? We've talked a little bit about how they gather in these large flocks during migration. They have what's known as site fidelity. So there's you know just a few key places where really large numbers of birds gather. And that is a challenge uh, for habitat protection and for uh, conservation. And so um, that's one of uh, the big challenges when we think about shorebird conservation, but it's also an opportunity, which we'll talk about a little bit too as we go on here. Another challenge is that they cross these huge geographic areas. Um, and so uh, it takes more than just working in one island or one state even, we're talking, it takes international co cooperation uh, to affect change for these birds. And they also depend on very imperiled habitat and specific food resources. They, they spend their lives in this narrow band of habitat between dry land and, and water. And so that's already a really narrow ribbon. Um, but on top of that, that, those coastal areas face huge threats from climate change, uh, loss of habitat from development, contamination and disturbance. Particularly on Cumberland Island, there are a few threats that I just wanted to talk about briefly. Disturbance, habitat loss, the loss of food resources and predation are all um, impacting shorebirds that are on Cumberland Island. Disturbance is, is one of the ones um, that I spend a lot of time thinking about and working with partners to address. Recreational disturbance is basically um, what happens when um, there's people or dogs using an area and it means that even if it's perfect habitat, it's great feeding area or perfect high tide roost or maybe lovely nesting areas, it becomes what's called functionally unavailable, right? Birds will not use those places if there are too many people. And when we see high amounts of recreational disturbance, we see lowered body condition, including decreased survival, um, lowered nest success, and birds are not able to feed as effectively sometimes wasting energy to fly away from people or dogs, which might not pose an actual threat, but that wasted energy can mean that migration doesn't happen successfully or even nesting up in the Arctic doesn't happen successfully. So this is a pretty significant problem across the whole um, hemisphere really, um, but uh, it is also a good opportunity for education and outreach. So it's not all doom and gloom, but it is a really significant problem. Um, particularly when we think about Cumberland Island, you know, increased boat traffic on the south end and on the north end, those inlet areas that are so important for nesting, 
um, that can be a really significant problem. And if you have a lot of people that set up to spend the day out on the beach right next to a nesting oyster catcher, that bird will not protect its nest from overheating or from predators. And so we can see really significant repercussions from disturbance. Habitat loss because of climate change that increases uh, the amount of extreme tides each year or sea level rise or erosion uh, limits places that shorebirds can nest, roost, and feed. And habitat loss um, potentially from some of the risks that uh, we see with, with new emerging threats like the Camden Spaceport could be significant as well. Um, this is a, an ongoing um, uh, potential development uh, on the mainland at Camden County with a spaceport that would essentially serve as a launching off point uh, for rockets going out over Cumberland. There's a number of folks that are working on this issue, including folks at the Southern, Southern Environmental Law Center, folks on Little Cumberland Island, uh, 100 Miles, um, Wild Cumberland, Georgia Audubon, uh, really trying to raise awareness and, and think through the risks and what, uh, what is at stake with uh, the creation of a spaceport on the mainland. And there's actually a precedent for um, how this could be a potentially terrible idea. Um, there is a space facility at Boca Chica in Texas um, where numerous explosions have really impacted the quality of habitat that a variety of shorebirds need along the Texas coast. So, uh, so that, that threat to habitat is, um, is pretty significant. Another important thing to consider uh, is threats to food resources. So we talked about how many food resources there are for shorebirds here along the Georgia coast. And, um, and we definitely see that on Cumberland. This is a, a little snapshot here, this video of horseshoe crab eggs that are very near to hatching, but you can see the little tiny um, uh, horseshoe crabs inside the eggs and a handful of horseshoe crab eggs. So between horseshoe crab uh, spawning, um, good food resources, like clams and surf clams, coquina clams and donax clams, um, there are really abundant food resources, but they need to be protected, um, particularly when we think about horseshoe crabs. Horseshoe crab conservation is inextricably linked to, uh, to shorebird conservation. Um, and then one other big threat uh, on Cumberland is predation as well, um, and that's impacting nesting shorebirds. And so um, the main predators, for nesting shorebirds um, are, are raccoons and coyotes. Um, and those uh, raccoons are unnaturally high in abundance. Coyotes are non-native. Um, and so there needs to be management to protect nesting shorebirds. And luckily um, there has been a great effort on Cumberland Island to protect nesting shorebirds um, from predation risks. Um, particularly um, Doug Hoffman, who I'm not sure if he's on this or not, uh, is, is an invaluable resource with the National Park Service um, that's worked tirelessly in cooperation with Georgia Department of Natural Resources to protect uh, nesting shorebirds. When I was doing my PhD research for three summers in a row, um, coyotes predated every single oyster catcher nest that I was monitoring. Um, and then um, Tim Kyes with Georgia DNR and Doug Hoffman created this ingenious system of creating an exclosure around the oyster catcher nests. And um, for the last several years, Cumberland Island has successfully produced American oyster catcher chicks um, because that predation risk has been addressed, which is exciting. So in, in thinking through all of those threats, it's important to think about all of the incredible um, partnerships and, uh, and tools that we have in our toolbox to address some of these threats. Some of the most significant ones are partnerships, using education and outreach, uh, coordinated research and coordinated management to, to really understand how the actions that we take in one specific place can be scaled up um, and affect shorebirds across the whole Georgia Bight. Again, one of those great partners that I wanted to give a little shout out to are Pat and Doris Leary, who supplied so many of these great stories, um, photos, and um, have really just uh, been instrumental in, in understanding what's going on on Cumberland in terms of shorebirds. Um, some of the other tools that we have in our toolbox, thinking a little bit more big picture outside of just the scope of Cumberland, um, are things like 
the International Shorebird Survey, which is something that Pat Leary has been helping on for, for years and I've mentioned already. This is a coordinated count of shorebirds during migration uh, to help us understand what's going on at each site in real time. And then that data can be analyzed and help create those population trends that we talked about. So having this sort of tool, these coordinated shorebird counts is, is critical for any kind of conservation action when we're thinking about shorebirds. Another very important conservation tool is the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network. I mentioned uh, that the Georgia Barrier Islands have been designated as a landscape of hemispheric importance, which is the largest designation. And, and in part, it's because we support 300 to 400,000 shorebirds every single year within the Georgia coast here. Um, there's two other wizard sites, as it's known, in the Georgia Bight, Altamaha River Delta and, and Cape Romaine Santee River Delta up in South Carolina. But basically, this is a network of about 110 sites across the hemisphere um, where folks are cooperating, communicating, and coordinating to try to protect all of the places that shorebirds need um, on these tremendous journeys. Um, another thing is, is building this network of shorebird conservationists, um, managers. Um, this is one of the things that we do at Manomet is, is really work with different partners on the ground to increase capacity and figure out how we can all work together and share information to be more effective in terms of habitat protection um, and promoting shorebird conservation. One of the best examples, I think, of um, these sorts of collaborations comes from the American Oyster Catcher Working Group, which was formed in 2001. Um, and this group has focused really a lot of attention and resources on American oyster catchers. Um, back in the early 2000s, the population of oyster catchers was uh, seemingly in decline. It, it looked like this very charismatic, um, emblematic shorebird was, was in trouble. Um, and um, recent surveys um, after years of work have shown that because of this collaborative, concentrated effort, we're actually seeing now population increases of oyster catchers. And, and that really um, is uh, in part because of having folks across the whole entire East Coast uh, working together to protect the places that oyster catchers need. Um, Manomet, uh, the organization I work for, is really all about building these partnerships and addressing shorebird conservation across uh, large geographic scales. Um, and so you can see just the smattering of some of the research that we're doing here in the Arctic, here in Georgia, um, really trying to connect the dots to understand how we can all work together to protect shorebirds and the places that they need. In the Georgia Bight, we're working on building this regional network to maintain these really valuable places and working with partners and managers um, doing research and, and working on projects that will help us plan habitat for the future as well. So there's a number of different ways that you can help shorebirds. I think one of the best ways is to hear these stories, get excited about shorebirds and share those stories with people um, when you see them. Um, there's other really easy concrete things that you can do, not driving on beaches, keeping dogs off of beaches, and importantly, giving birds their space um, when you see them on the beach. You know, it might be a flock of of sandpipers, you may not even know their story, but chances are they could have just traveled thousands of miles and they need to rest and feed um, on the beach. And so giving them space, walking around them can be a really important thing to do so that they don't waste that energy. If you're interested, you can become a citizen scientist, you can uh, contribute to international shorebird surveys. Um, and it's also um, a fun way to just um, record what's going on in your favorite birding spot and have those numbers actually mean something. Um, being a voice, uh, for biologists at the front lines of conservation is wonderful as well. And then helping uh, fund conservation efforts is also really critical. Um, so um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Karina so we have some time for questions. Um, and um, I have my contact information there, but I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we can share contact information later. Right. Abby, that was absolutely incredible. My jaw was on my knees the whole time <laughs> with those videos. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I, as many times as I've heard you talk about shorebirds, every single time I learned so much. Um, we do have a few questions from the audience that I wanted to make sure were passed through. Um, and first, um, Nancy asked about how the proposed spaceport will affect birds on Cumberland Island. And I know you touched on that and even with a worst case scenario um, from other spaceports, but, but if there's anything else you wanted to add, um, do let me know uh, for Nancy. 
Yeah, I think, you know, it's it's a little bit of an unknown um, right now, but the idea that um, there could be damage to sensitive places like Cumberland Island, the salt marsh that would be surrounding the spaceport, all of those issues have um, have impacts that could could be detrimental to shorebirds um, in terms of impacting food quality or nesting sites. Um, there's a whole host of other issues with water quality and some of the other things um, that having that infrastructure could uh, could create. And so it's a, a really complex issue. And I might try while we're talking here to find some links um, that we can send people for resources to. Um, so. Awesome. Thank you, Abby. Thank you so much for that. And really quickly, I actually wanted to um, put in the chat, um, Abby mentioned Monty and Rose, the two, um, can you remember what they are, what their species is? Piping clovers. Piping clovers, yes. Yeah. Um, there's going to be, she mentioned a movie that was made about them and we're actually going to be um, uh, watching that, having a watch party essentially oh, yeah. virtually. Um, so I've put in the chat the trailer for the movie as well as the registration if you'd like to join awesome. us. Awesome. And people um, can know that those guys, their offspring showed up in our backyard, which is so exciting. Yes, that is incredible <laughs> and such a success. We're so happy about that. Um, Anna asked, how is climate change impacting the migratory paths and behaviors of shorebirds? Um, that's a, another really great and big question. Um, and so certainly things like sea level rise, um, which I kind of touched on, you know, it's, it's, we're seeing increased coastal flooding, which could decrease um, habitat for nesting and for feeding and for roosting shorebirds. Um, particularly, you know, if you're thinking about migration, these guys have, they really have to put on the fuel and they have to have not only good places to feed, but also really good places to roost. Places that will stay high and dry during high tide when all of those feeding resources are covered up by water. And so if we see a sea level rise happening um, too quickly for any of those natural processes to keep up with like uh, accretion of sand um, or shell rakes that the birds roost on just being completely overwashed at high tide, then they're not gonna be able to find those safe places to roost. And so that can have some really significant impacts as well. There's also climate change impacts happening up on the nesting grounds in the Arctic with things like changing snow melt patterns and food availability and just really it's kind of a, a snowballing kind of domino effect where there are a lot of repercussions that are happening because of increased storms, increased sea level rise, increased temperatures. Um, so lots of different factors that could probably be a whole webinar all unto itself. Yeah, thank you, Abby. And thank you so much for that question. Um, Tixie asked, just to help me get my brain around it, the red knot travels how many miles a year? And the bird, B95, who has traveled to the moon and back, <laughs> is, is it still migrating? <laughs> no, um, unfortunately, B95 hasn't been seen since, I think for some reason 2014 sticks in my mind. I may be wrong on that, um, but but that bird, you know, the lifespan of those birds for t about 20 years of being recited, that's like, that's a long life for a shorebird of that size. And so um, that bird, that bird is probably no longer with us, um, but hopefully many of its offspring are. And so, um, yeah, birds that travel like that entire distance uh, from Tierra del Fuego all the way up uh, is uh, about 19,000 miles. That's incredible. That's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, Abby, and thank you, Tixie. Um, we'll answer one or two more questions. Um, Mary asked, how can we balance keeping Cumberland Island and other wild places disturbance free while also inviting oh. people to see these wild places? I yeah. feel like Cumberland does a good job of limiting the amount of people, but wondered what you thought. That's a great question. And it's it's really important because certainly if people don't get to experience these places, they don't know them and they don't love them and they don't understand how important they are to protect. Um, so it's a balancing act. Um, you know, there's definitely simple steps that people can take, anyone can take, you know, really, as I mentioned during the nesting season, staying on the wet sand and, and avoid going above the tide line 
or avoid walking through flocks of birds that you see on the beach. You know, for some reason, people love to chase birds. And um, I always see that and think that bird might have flown from Brazil. What are you doing? So um, helping, helping to avoid creating disturbance and also helping spread the message. Um, you know, you don't have to know everything about shorebirds, but if you remember one or two things about the journey of, let's say, a red knot, um, you can share that story with people and really help raise awareness. Um, and so I think those kinds of simple steps can be really important um, and, and can help make sure that we are all able to share the shoreline with the shorebirds. Amazing. Thank you so much, Abby. Jess, I know you wanted to share a bit of information before everyone um, logged off. So I wanted to, to make that option available to you. Um, and then after you do that, I'll try to throw in one last question for Abby before everyone uh, departs from us this evening. Oh, uh, oh, you're on mute, Jess. Thanks. Yeah, we typically get a whole lot of questions um, about how to visit Cumberland Island. And so I want to make sure that everybody has access to that information. Um, certainly, it takes a little bit of coordinating because, as mentioned, there are no vehicular uh, bridges to the island. But you can see here that you can book your campsite um, in advance at recreation.gov. You can go for a day trip and just take the ferry boat over, enjoy the island for the day. So there are a number of ways that you can access the island, and those websites will give you a little bit more information. But yes, I want to make sure we throw it back to Abby because she has such important information to share. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jess. And if you wouldn't mind throwing those links in the chat, we can have that available and folks can just um, keep that for their information. I visited Cumberland for the first time and camped um, with Jess and Abby was there as well. And I have to tell you, it was the most magical experience of my life. Um, so if you're able, I do highly recommend it. Um, just to answer uh, one of the questions that were in the chat, um, Anna asked, what is required to become a citizen science for shorebird mm -hmm. efforts? Great, that's another fantastic question. Um, yeah, so if you are in a spot where there are shorebirds and you wanna get involved with efforts like the International Shorebird Survey, please reach out to me and I can connect you with the Manomet team um, that's helping train folks and coordinate ISS and we can help get you looped in to what might already be going on or help you establish your own site. Um, there are also a lot of opportunities that we're working on building out that involve stewarding. So that's basically just helping spread the message and, and protecting these important places that shorebirds need. Um, both during nesting, um, we're going to be launching a program where we're doing stewarding at boat ramps to talk to recreational boaters um, and, um, and working on thinking about uh, stewarding outside of just the nesting season as well. So there are a lot of opportunities. And I think if anybody wants to get involved, either getting in touch with with you, Karina, and you can funnel them to me or they can reach out to me directly. Um, or if you're not here in Georgia and you wanna get involved in other ways, um, you know, local Audubon groups um, do, do this kind of work really uh, in many places as well. So either reach out to Manomet or Audubon or your local Audubon group and we can get you, get you um, looped in. Awesome. Um, and I know I said that was the last one, but there's one more <laughs> important question and then we're done. And as Abby's answering, I'm going to go ahead and put Abby's email in the chat for you um, so that you can reach out for, to her if you have any questions about that. The final question from Tixie is, what are some of the other Georgia barrier islands that remain uh, a viable key habitat for shorebirds in addition to mm. Cumberland Island? Yeah, we are so lucky in Georgia. We have, you know, depending on who's counting, we have about 14 barrier islands and about 11 of those islands are pretty much undeveloped without bridges and, and, uh, and easy access. And so that means those places are all really important for shorebirds. Um, there's certainly other key areas for migrating shorebirds where feeding resources are really good um, during horseshoe crab spawning season. Um, and even some of the public access beaches like Jekyll Island and St. Simons Island and Tybee have really important places for shorebirds as well. Um, areas where wildlife thrive. And so one of the things that we're working on is helping to highlight some of those wildlife beach zones. Um, places like Gould's Inlet on St. Simons Island, if you're familiar, or the south end of Jekyll or the north end of Tybee Island um, near Polk Street are all really great places um, to spend some time and see shorebirds in a, in a way that's very easy to access. 
Incredible. Well, thank you so, so very much, Dr. Abby. It was a pleasure to learn from you, an honor to learn from you. Um, and I hope you all had a, a fantastic time. Please do feel free to learn more about Manomet or Wild Cumberland or Georgia Audubon. All three organizations have wonderful resources on how you can help to protect and enjoy the incredible landscapes and ecosystems that are refuges for birds across Georgia, across the coast, and specifically on Cumberland Island. Um, so I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day. Um, and thank you so much for coming, everyone. Thank you so much, Karina and Jess. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye.